Welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain. I'm here with my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. It's April 2025, and already we have seen 10 new FDA approvals in the world of cancer. As a community oncologist, given most of our cancer patients get treatment in these settings, we have to keep up with all this. Today, we're going to dive into the most recent approval here, cabozantinib, for neuroendocrine tumor based off of cabinet study. For this, we are joined by Dr. Aman Chauhan, a medical oncologist who strictly focuses on neuroendocrine tumor from Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Miami. Aman, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Rahul and Rohit. It's a pleasure to be here and congratulations on the great work you're doing in educating the oncology community and keeping them up to date with the newest and latest data. Aman, welcome. Thank you so much for your kind words. So to get started today, and set the foundation here for practicing oncologists when it comes to neuroendocrine tumors. We have to keep a few things in mind. Where did this all start? Is it small bowel? Is it pancreas? Is it lungs? And then the grade and differentiation also plays a role. Of course, the extent of the disease. Based on all this, we're leaning into surgery, somatostatin analogs, or other systemic chemotherapy options. But now we also have cabozantinib, which is available based off cabinet study. Aman, can you start us here with a little background and the study design for cabinet study? Great. Before we go into cabinet study, I just want to prime the audience that neuroendocrine tumor used to be thought rare cancers, right? But incidence is on the right, but even more problematic is the cumulative prevalence because our patients live for years. So no longer a rare tumor. For years, we were scrambling to find effective options. Fortunately, last five to six years, we've made a lot of progress. And now we have a problem. It's a good problem to have that we have multiple treatment options. And the latest kit on the block is cabozantinib based on the cabinet trial. It's a significant milestone in our management algorithm because it really opens a lot of options. So cabinet study really built on the success of a prior phase two study done with cabozantinib in neuroendocrine tumor patients. We knew that a VEGF inhibition is active and is going to yield results because we saw some early success with lenvatinib and other TKIs. However, these, for whatever reason, never crossed the finish line. And that's where kudos to cabinet team, especially Dr. Jennifer Chan. They continued. This was a study looking at all neuroendocrine tumors, had two cohorts, pancreatic NETs and extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor cohort. Now, as you know, neuroendocrine tumors are not married to a certain organ system. You can see neuroendocrine tumors almost anywhere in the body, but primarily lung, pancreas, and GI Mm -hmm. tract are the three commonest sites. And many studies have often either left out lung nets or Mm -hmm. certain subsect of nets. So this is the bad, you know, positive and very inclusive. It was all comers. So pancreatic net and extra pancreatic, which included your GI nets primarily and thoracic nets. The other very unique aspect, as you alluded to, uh, about neuroendocrine tumors is it comes in different flavors based on the grade. That's grade one, two, and three. And that's really based on the key 67 or mitotic index. Higher the grade, more aggressive the biology. And again, since the grade three well different neuroendocrine tumor is a relatively newer entity, the, the historical studies have often missed out on formally studying the grade three biology. Lately, we had Netter 2 focusing on that aggressive biology, and this is a fantastic addition to more data in this aggressive biology. This cabinet study also included grade two, higher grade two, and grade three well differential neuroendocrine tumors. The study design was pretty straightforward. It is a placebo control blindly. Patients were randomized to is two. And secondly, there was crossover allowed. So at time of progression, so even patients who were randomized to placebo had an opportunity to get cabozantinib at progression. The starting dose of cabozantinib was 60 milligram. I have my own thoughts. We'll talk about that later, (laughs) Uh, but that was 60 milligram. However, dose reductions were allowed as expected for toxicity reasons. Primary endpoint of the study was looking at median progression-free survival. And secondary endpoints included response rates, overall survival, quality of life in disease, et cetera. Thanks for going over that. The fair criticism we have seen is the comparator arm being placebo. 
in clinical practice, these patients would have been something or the other. When you take a closer look at the patient characteristics, most had three prior lines of treatment, rather heavily pre-treated patient population. Point well taken. I personally don't like placebo control studies in general. However, this was a fairly designed study. The patients who participated had progressed on at least one, but majority of patients had several lines of therapies. If you see, there's at least two to three lines of therapies. The problem is we don't have a lot of options when it comes to lung nets. The only the approved therapies are SMAS and analog and mTOR inhibitor. For grade three, well different NET, uh, anything, anything at this point is questionable and arguable. What is be improved in that space? For mid-gut and pancreatic, yes, SSA, PRRT, R, and, and mTOR are well established. And it is very reflected in this patient population. Majority of patients had either prior PRRT and vast majority also had prior Affinitor. In fact, there are patients who might even have had Cape Tam and Sutent, especially in pancreatic net arm. I do feel that this was a well-designed study and placebo control was ethical for this space at that time of design. As far as the results go, let's talk about pancreatic net first. And we knew from previous studies in Lenvent and other VEGF TKIs that this is where it's going to shine a lot more. And as expected, we saw great PFS benefit, 13.8 months in study arm with CABO versus 4.4 months. This is just amazing, especially considering a patient who's been through two, three, four lines of therapy, some even through cytotoxic chemo. Another interesting point was patients who had even progressed on prior VEGF TKLI sunitinib, they tend to also benefit. So across the board, there was efficacy noted in, in Cabo's Antonib arm, and then very, very heartening to see those results. As far as the overall survival is concerned, our neuroendocrine tumor studies, because of the nature of this cancer, it's an indolent yep. cancer, certain lymphomas also right. suffer from that. It's difficult to see the OS benefit. In fact, there is not a single randomized phase three study that has shown statistically significant OS benefit for yeah. any drug in neuroendocrine tumor space. That tells you not about the drugs, it's just the disease itself. Yep. Most of these patients crossed over to get active treatment or other treatments on other trials or standard of care. I take the overall survival data with a grain of salt when it comes to neuroendocrine tumors. However, the median PFS is a great surrogate endpoint, and we have seen how median PFS has led to the approvals and have left to improvement in overall survival of our neuroendocrine cancer patients over the last 10 years. These are exciting times. These patients are living longer and longer, and I sound like a broken record when I say this. Each treatment, particularly in palliative settings, these medications have to make our patients live better and longer. And here we are seeing that progression-free survival. Based on this, cabozantinib was approved on March 28, 2025. When it comes to this approval in cabozantinib, Amin, how are you going to sequence this? What does it really mean for that patient in front of us? Are you planning to use this after PRRT? Are you going to use this before? Are you reserving this in later lines with refractory settings? What's your practice going to be around cabozantinib? Great question. I wish I could give you a straightforward answer. Neuroendocrine tumors are very nuanced. You know, right behind me, you see a zebra and <laughs> zebra is our mascot because no two zebras have same zebra stripes. So no two neuroendocrine tumor patients are same. You see a lot of divergent dichotomy in behavior of these cancers based on the grade, etc. So somebody might be stable on some as an analog for 10 years, and other, other similar patient might have just progressed on six months. So again, it's very difficult. You have to have a nuanced approach when it comes to neuroendocrine tumor. However, having said that, almost all metastatic patients would have had at least somatosan analog, and that's the FDA label too, progressed on prior therapy. And that prior therapy, most of the time for low-grade patients would be SSA. PRRT is now based on its efficacy and comfort level and quality of life improvement data is, is, has consolidated itself as a go-to second line for most patients. 
Cabo, I foresee, is going to fill in the third line niche. If there is a patient who might not be a good candidate of VEGF TKI, you know, we have then other options for, for example, somebody has a large volume disease pancreatic neck patients rapidly evolving. I'm going to try cytotoxic chemo with Cape Temp. Great Absolutely. data, great results, and the superior response rates. So again, you really have to tailor to each needs. We are, however, noticing that prolonged use of alkylator-based therapies like cape temozolomide can heighten the risk of MDS leukemia, especially in the era of theranosics, where most patients will get some radionuclide-based therapies. My preference is moving away from using too much of alkylator-based therapies, unless a specific scenario necessitates it. I see carbozantinib entering in the third line space and, and still leaving a lot of plan B options for us, be it Afinitor, Sunitinib, Cape Tem, et cetera. Good times, especially for PNET patients. Okay. When it comes to lung nets, lung nets is very unique because yep. There is a vast, vast population of lung net patients who won't express somatostatin receptors. So that takes somatostatin analogs and PRRT out of our armamentarium. So it's even more crucial to have non-SSTR targeted therapies available to us. So right now we had Affinitor on label, yep. especially if you have a lung net patient who don't express somatostatin analogs, we can arguably use uh, Finitor and then cabozantinib right away. Similarly for grade three, that's our third major category now. Grade three, site diagnostic, no matter where they're coming from. For grade three well different neuronicin tumors, Netter 2 really sets the stage for upfront use of PRRT in the right patient. Oftentimes, grade three patients can suffer from rapid tumor growth. So we are short of time and we are not able to get the PET scans and PRT aligned up and nuclear medicine referrals. So starting chemo is not a bad choice. Chemo followed by CABO or PRT followed by CABO may be a very good option for higher grade tumors. And that's how I foresee it's going to start moving behind PRT, but above other targeted therapies, the third line space. And one thing to reiterate here is when we're talking about PRRT, not every single patient is going to qualify for this. Access mm -hmm. still ends up being an issue in rural settings. You still have to keep the kidney function in mind. And again, for extra pancreatic, we're still seeing that PFS benefit with cabozantinib. And the study showed there was benefit in all subsets. Absolutely. Right. Another area where I'm using more and more cabo is patients who we, we, at, at present, we have we are treating patients who've been treated with lutetera or PRRT in the past. In fact, they've been retreated with PRRT as off-label because of lack of treatment options. They've exhausted Cape Tem. Now they have chronic thrombocytopenias. Yep. They otherwise have great performance status and active life, and the cancer is progressing. We cannot do more cytotoxic chemo, very harsh on their bone marrow, and more PRRT because of thrombocytopenia. Cabozantinib is not as tough on marrow as compared to Cape Tem and PRRT and has really helped rescue a lot of my patients and stabilize their cancer in those scenarios. Now, these are legacy patients who had yeah. several pretreatments, but they'll continue to go on and live several years, hopefully. But these are the advances that allows us to continue to treat them despite having these bone marrow issues, other issues. Right. In summary, if one is SSTR positive, then just like trial design here, one would utilize cabozantinib somewhere about third line or more. And if one is negative, especially for grade three or lung neuroendocrine tumor, where we have limited choices to consider this in second line. Now, talking about the side effects here, as a community in cultures, we have utilized cabozantinib in kidney cancer, liver yep. cancer, and now we will be using it in neuroendocrine tumors. We have seen the class side effects for TKIs, that is GI side effects or hypertension, but some of these GI side effects can also mimic the underlying disease of neuroendocrine tumor itself. Amun, as we were talking about the study design for 60 milligrams, do you start these patients off at 60 milligrams or rely on 40 milligrams and then decide this needs to be up titrated? And if you could please go over the side effect profile and some clinical pearls around that. Right. The study team might not like me for this, but I'm a big <laughs> fan of 40 milligram. I think there's plenty of opportunity to go up in the right patient. But in my experience, majority of patients would only tolerate 40. 
and if that, sometimes I might even have to dose reduce from 40 to yep. 20. In fact, a subgroup analysis on the trial suggests that I think majority of patients eventually the cumulative dose was close to 40 and not 60 as expected. I think this is one of those drugs where the uptake in community would be easier because you all been using cabozantin okay. for way longer than the net folks been using cabozantin. There's a lot of comfort level. Doctors already know how to administer it, optimize the dose, and shepherd the patients through various toxicity issues. So yeah, my preference is 40 milligrams. I think I'm going to stick with that. With regards to cabozantin, it's a VEGF TKI. You got to make sure patient has baseline good renal function, no hypertension issues. Yeah. The common side effects with I actually see is fatigue, maybe a little bit of diarrhea. In NETS patients, especially because some of them may have carcinoid syndrome or VIPoma, exactly. so they have diarrhea at baseline from the cancer. Know if it's a TKI mediated or disease related so you can optimize it and treat it appropriately. Cutaneous toxicities are also not uncommon, especially in the palms and soles, but I've seen rashes in other areas, scalps and face as well. But on average, if we start the right dose and find the right dose in our patient, we are able to cruise the patient along and keep them on the treatment longer and stabilize their cancer. The quality of life data suggests that there was no deterioration in the quality of life with cabozentinib. A TKI, very effective and active TKI, is not leading to deterioration quality of life. I think that's definitely a win. A patient who are otherwise progressing and the tumor burden itself can cause quality of life issues. And so I think that's important to highlight. And Rohit, I mean, I have to agree, out in the community, we do have a lot of experience with these TKIs, be it cabozantinib or lenvatinib, but we still have to keep these side effects, hypertension, diarrhea, fatigue, some elevation in ASD, ALT in mind. I mean, we've covered a lot here from complex nature of neuroendocrine tumor to treatment landscape with this recent approval. Before we close, any last thoughts around this study or neuroendocrine tumors in general for our listeners? I think this is a, a, a big step forward in neuroendocrine oncology field. I would encourage other drug developers to be inclusive, include all site agnostic neuroendocrine mm -hmm. tumors, grade agnostics, higher grade, because nobody's going to develop a trial for a grade three tumor, which is a very smaller piece of pie. So, and these patients exist. And because of the prevalence, grave prevalence, there is an unmet need. I think this might be the last of the placebo controlled trials. Our landscape has evolved and we are fortunate that we have multiple treatment options. And, and the next generation of studies will look into more sequencing rather than finding more options. And I think that that's the need of the hour. Absolutely. So better comparator arms. We have more options, sequencing. These are the things to keep in mind. Amon, thank you so much for taking the time to touch on this recent approval of cabozantinib based of cabinet study. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In today's discussion with Dr. Amon Chohan, a medical oncologist from Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, we had a chance to discuss the phase three cabinet study that led to the approval of cabozantinib in previously treated unresectable locally advanced or metastatic pancreatic and extrapancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We touched on the improved PFS with CABO when compared to placebo. And we saw improved PFS in all comers here, Raho. Yes, yes, absolutely. This is now part of our standard of care treatment option. Rahul, though 60 milligram was the study design in the clinical trial, a lot of us in practice are often using 40 milligrams, and that's what Dr. Chohan alluded to as well. There are ongoing trials to ensure we are not compromising outcomes, but this lower dose is my starting point and is often better tolerated. With cabozantinib, we have to keep hypertension, fatigue, diarrhea in mind. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to check out our other discussions around FDA approvals, talks check, and conference highlights. We are the Oncology Brothers.